today's presentation on uh, directly directional drilling for uh, tunnel investigation. Indeed, this is our first uh, first presentation that's both online or in person, so we're very excited. Um, but before I, I welcome the presenter, I'd just like to take this opportunity to, to make our acknowledgement of country. Sorry, let me just get the slides advancing. Oh, yeah, it wasn't working. Okay, um, so Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia um, and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we pay our respects to them and to their cultures and to their elders past, present and emerging. So before, uh, before we start, uh, before I introduce Ian, I'm just going to uh, give a few announcements of some of the things that are, are coming up. Uh, but before that, I just want to acknowledge the, um, uh, the Queensland Committee. Um, we've helped put this event on. And also uh, our platinum sponsors, um, our gold supporting members, and uh, also our, our silver supporting members. I'd also like to say on the, on the 31st of March, um, we, we've got a, a, our uh, Young Members um, event, and there's a couple of people giving, giving presentations. Uh, they both promise to be very interesting. Um, it's, it's also an online and, uh, and live event, so even if you're not a Young Member, I'd encourage you to register and come along and show your support to, to our Young Members. Um, we also have a, a, an Engineering Heroes uh, Young Members event, which is on the 20th of May this year. Um, and that's uh, $15 for members and students and $45 for, for, for non-members. That's, that's on the 20th of May. Um, and then I'd also like to, to advertise, our, we, we're having a one-day workshop on the 16th of, uh, 16th of September. Um, so uh, please, I'd invite you all to, to block that date off in your diaries, and we'll be sending you information about that um, And also, it's, it's been long awaited, it's been delayed, but the ATS uh, 2020 conference is happening. Um, it's happening not in 2020, but it's happening on the 10th to the 13th of May this year. So um, I'm sure many of us are very excited for that. Um, it's been a great conference in the past, and uh, we're all looking forward to going to Melbourne. I hope, I hope you have a great conference on the 10th to the 13th of May. So make sure you block that off and make sure, make sure you attend. And you can get further information about that on our website. And also, another date for your diaries, um, we're having an end-of-year celebration on St. Barbara's Day, which was, uh, we're having on December the 3rd, um, the evening of December the 3rd. So you can block that date off in your diaries as well. Um, last year, we had a really great get-together, um, uh, just celebrating the year, and I uh, hope to do it again this year, so block that date in your diaries. So now on to our presentation. Um, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Ian Gray. Um, he started, uh, started work as a civil engineer in New Zealand in 1977, then came to the University of uh, New South Wales in Australia in 1978. Um, and then he's worked for um, Australian Coal from 1979 to 1982. Um, and then uh, worked as a geotechnical engineer for the Hong Kong government um, until the end of 1988. And then uh, in 1994, he started uh, Segra, and um, it's, it's grown ever since then. It's, and uh, it's spanning ga uh, mining, gas, and geotechnical work, providing services, solutions, and products to all those industries, um, including gas exploration, mine design, hydroelectric power investigation, um, spanning diverse locations from Arctic Russia uh, right down to, to Patagonia. Um, Seagra's products include its own instrumentation, uh, including stress measurement tools, drill stone test tools, and drilling equipment. Um, on the he heavy equipment side, it manufactures uh, well control systems and packers, it has, and has its own gas and geomechanical uh, laboratories. Ian's got some 86 publications on such diverse topics of reservoir engineering to piling. He also has multiple patents covering such varied items as mining systems to cyclonic separators. So. Um, I'd invite you all to, to welcome Ian um, to give his presentation. Thank you, Anthony. Sometimes I think 
think I might sound a bit like the future when we go through things like that. Um, no, I'm going to learn how to drive this thing, so I can't use the... Yes, I can use them. Good. Okay, directional drilling for tunnelling. Um, for many tunnels, you wouldn't dream of doing directional drilling. It would be the least effective thing you could possibly do. Um, but in some terms, it, it would be exceedingly effective way to go about site investigation, or as we would probably call it, exploration. So if you want to, there's a big difference probably between the mining world and the um, civil world in uh, that civil tunnels tend to be decreed by somebody drawing a line on a plan, please don't move, and so then you've got to make the tunnel fit the line, whereas if you do a mine or you do a, a gas investigation, you do your exploration and then decide where you want to put the mine and work out things around it. So sometimes it might be too difficult to deal with and sometimes it might not and you change your ways. These in the civil engineering, you tend to have to make your um, engineering uh, or fit into the rock types. Um, in mining, you might make your engineering go around the ones you don't like for geotechnical or economic reasons of um, uh, ore bodies. Right, so if you're going to go do a tunnel, that, that's actually a very big difference. Um, the ability to design what you want as opposed to saying it's got to go from here to here because it's got a purpose. And um, civil engineers would actually be well advised at times to do a little bit of thinking about what alternative alignments are because you can make your life exceedingly difficult by saying something is going to go from here to here. I had a discussion over a job a couple of years ago which got to be quite interesting in terms of you are mad to put it here because it is going to cost you a billion dollars. But in mind. So we need to look at rock types. We need to look at rock structure. That's the fabric, the joints, uh, everything that it might move on. We need to look at rock properties. How strong are they? We need to look at the stress in the rock. Is it going to break things? Importantly, we need to look at ground fluids. Why does that thing beep at me? Um, we need to look at ground fluids. Now, I spend a little bit of time talking to people involved in the Turin to Leon to Turin tunnel and they really wanted to go 2017 the World Tunneling Congress and the amount of work going into looking at issues such as ground fluids and particularly gas in rocks because we're looking at sedimentary rocks was absolutely minimal and could bring things to a pretty major halt so Let's look at what you might doing. So I've got a pinched a couple of pictures here because they're good pictures and I didn't have to draw them. The top one is of essentially um, <clears throat> flat lying sedimentary beds and you want to put a tunnel through them and they're mostly in one particular formation or they might cross over into one other. But you can probably access most of your geological variability by drilling principally perpendicularly to the uh, strata. Now you might still want to drill laterally or horizontally or tunnel alignment wise if you had faults or other structures that you wanted to pick up. However, if you had a complex structure such as that below, you might really want to drill it, particularly if it's hard access from the top. And even if you did drill from the top there, you may not be able to see what you're looking at because the drill hole won't go where you want it to. And yes, you could go over it and drill a lot of angled holes but you may not have access, particularly if you're in mountainous areas. Uh, we must also take into account the civil, uh, the city side of things where access is not always possible. Um, another way of looking at it. It's also possible to pick different lithologies. Uh, it may be possible to pick different lithologies by um, open hole drilling and branching. This is a picture of a coal mining thing where people drill drilling actually in the coal seam. Oops, yeah, I'm not allowed to pick the point there. I've got a point on here so that other people can see it. Um, this is meant to be a coal seam. This is a real case we're dealing with. And um, they've cored and they've popped up to pick up the roof and floor and they might be able to core that. Some way of doing it. Um, so these things are possible. So if we're going to drill an open, which I call a non-cored hole, we've got the options and I'm going through options which I'm pretty well cover the range and some of them you wouldn't dream of using. Um, deflecting bits to drill through soil, the same sort of thing as the people who put in services along roadways would use. 
Um, jetting bits in softer rock, that's an old oil field technique, which probably won't be the first choice now, but I'll just take you through it. If you're coring, you might want to use wedges to deflect a hole. You might want to deflect a, a non-core hole, actually, by wedges, but less so these days. Probably the most familiar means to do this is a downhole mud motor, and a downhole mud motor is powered by fluid which is pumped through the drill string and operates a... Um, helical rotor in something like a reverse um, positive displacement pump, uh, Monais principle to positive displacement pumps. There's also a thing called dual pipe string drilling systems, which I'll show you a picture of. Then we get to the modern stuff, which is the modern, really modern um, oil field, which is rotary steering systems, where you can turn the drill string and still have it steered. And then you, in hard rock, you might like to have a down the hole hammer to cut through harder material in a hurry. Um, <clears throat> so here's examples I've just picked off the web of bolt-on deflecting bits for soft rock. And essentially you push these things along and they'll go in the direction you deflect them. You might be able to rotate them if you've got to cut something a bit harder. There's a variety of options there. If you want to set a wedge, and here I've shown a wedge that might be used in coring or a plug that might be. Now, there's a thing called a Van Ruth plug here, which is over here, which would be pumped through a, a wireline core string. And it's actually got a hardwood plug behind it, and if it doesn't change on me, a wedge. And the wedge um, will deflect out of that hole. Now, that still has its uses. If you want to take a sample of something, dropping a wedge in, particularly with the coring system, is quite a, a good way of doing it. Uh, here's the concept of the jetting mix for soft rock, oil field stuff. And when we say soft, it's not necessarily all that soft. You can erode sandstones very effectively with a, a couple of thousand PSI going through a jetting bit. And what people do is hold the drill string steady with a particular orientation, erode, and then rotate, typically with a tricone. And that cuts a hole in and you can deflect a drill string. Um, here is the mud motor, which is the tool probably of most common choice at the moment. And the mud motor has this helical rotor up here in the back. It may have some stabilizers near the bit. It's typically got a polycrystalline bit. And it works by pumping fluid through these cavities, which are set in a helix. And it rotates around and cuts, um, cuts rock. Um, of course, there's a matter of where you point it and how it goes. So once again, it goes where you point the, um, the motor. And this thing will have a s adjustable... Well, this one's got an adjustable housing. Most of them would be fixed housing, so you set the housing to a certain bend. But that has a particular problem, because if you've got something set to a bend, it's going to want to build like that. And then if you want to change it, you're going to have to build like that. And then you're going to have to build like that. So you get multiple... Um, changes of direction and you don't quite know what your change of direction is as you drill because your survey system is somewhere way behind here because these there's a very few of these made of copper beryllium non-magnetic material with the majority of them made of steel so you have to set your magnetic survey systems some way back and so you're guessing where you are um, and you're drilling to that right if you look at the mud motor bottom hole, that's that system back here. You might call this thing here a bottom hole assembly. That would be the oil field term. If you look at a bottom hole assembly, um, here's one of the build-up characteristics in a particular formation. And as you can see, it's not particularly favourable. So what I've got is if you have the bend pointing straight up at 360 degrees, it'll build up then at maybe less than 0.1 of a degree uh, um, a degree per meter but if you happen to turn it over a bit if you turn it 180 degrees which is 180 there is diving down at nearly half a degree so you've got to be really careful because this thing will sink very easily so you can make it go sideways but it won't go sideways quite as you want it to go sideways because it's dependent on the formation that you want to drill in and what the characteristics of the rock is and here I'm looking at sedimentary formations. Um, you can have another characteristic here, and one of the, the here's another one. 
Well, that's a bit different. This is representative of the stress in the rock and how it's breaking out uh, with stress. It's how it's representative of jointing within the material, which is forcing the drill to follow a particular direction. In this case, it's more stress control. Um, and you can see that you've got to keep your wits about you to know where you're going. Right, there are other systems, the dual drill string systems. This is once again more of a civil um, services type approach. It's particularly a manufacturer, I don't know whether it's more than one, who puts in a system where you have a casing and the casing has within it a drill string and the drill string has a bit on the end and uh, the mud is circulated through the bit and mostly back down inside the casing and the direction is again changed by the side of the bent sub. So you actually twist the casing around to make it go in a particular direction. So once again, you've got a hole which might steer around like this. Um, and um, they're of limited range, basically because you're going to end up with friction between your casing and your material. You're not lubricating it. You're not cutting hugely oversized. Um, um, they fit a particular niche. Uh, as do most things do, but they're not really the long range systems. Um, so back in the top there, you've got a, a drill string, which is a dual drill string, uh, the inside and the outside one. Now, down the hole hammer drilling, as a builder of a down the hole hammer, which has directional capability, uh, which sort of got stranded about 2000 through lack of funds. Um, but the general approach, there are alternatives, but here's the general approach is to have a bit which tends to build in a particular direction and to rotate the drill string in an arc to build in a particular direction. And then you might rotate the entire drill string around to drill straight ahead. Um, it's, it has its uses. You might want to put services in with the thing. I don't think there are many cases where you do tunnel exploration with this. Um, then we get on to more oil field systems here, um, the rotary steering systems. Rotary steering systems uh, come basically in two forms. One is where you would have a um, set of pads here which can push outwards, and this is a sleeve that does not rotate. You're rotating the drill string, so if, you go, if I go back a couple here for a minute, you can see that if I rotate this drill string or this particular situation and it has an angular build like that, then the average build is downwards. And this thing is going to go down towards the floor and you can't do that. It's nice to stir up cuttings and move things, but um, they have particular characteristics which are going to depend also on the rock being cut. So. <clears throat> There's great benefits, as I'll go into later, about actually rotating a drill string. Apart from the fact you can get power down there, which may be greater than you get with a mud motor. Not also, because there's some very high power mud motors in the bigger sizes. Um, you've got these pads, and these pads push this, and there's a stabiliser here, and they actually bend this unit and point the bit in a particular direction. So it points and does so. And because these pads are adjustable, you can drill straight a straight hole if you want to. Drilling a straight hole has great advantages. Now, in the full oil fill form, these things have down the hole smarts, which means they can self steer and you can talk to them and say, steer in this direction, do what you're told, and it will tend to follow or try to follow what it's supposed to do. Um, they would come with possibly some geophysics in there to help them stay within the formation, which is the productive formation. Here's a different version. And here you've got a version, again, with a polycrystalline diamond cutter or poly, um, PCD or PC, PDC, depending on which industry you're in. Uh, here's one where the pads pop in and out, and they pop in and out at a great rate of knots, depending on the, the drill string. So they're turning and pushing this, this bit from dry, directly high in the bit. Um, we have built a slightly dumbed down version, but not particularly dumbed down, which is a point the bit system. And here is a, the sleeve which controls it, and it will push, and it will, there's your front stabiliser, and it will point the bit and directionally steer this uh, assembly. This is a small assembly, it's a 99mm version in this one, because it was built specifically towards the underground mining industry, though it has other uses. 
Um, so basically what the idea of the rotary steering sleeve um, with controls and it's designed to point. Now the beauty of um, rotating the drill string, be it one of these or these, really comes in the hydraulics and I'll get to talk about all the complications with hydraulics but essentially you can build up with cuttings beds if you don't move them you can get caught in hole. So if we're going to go into rock drilling options and I'm going to go more towards the rock because I don't think most tunnel investigations will want to use um, if you've got soils this probably isn't the way to go you're going to be you have a very limited range that you can deal with. So if you're going to go open hole practically you're looking at downhole mud motors or you're looking at rotary steered systems. In a cord hole, you might use, I didn't do this, but um, in mind, uh, you're looking at conventional coring, and I've put un, because nearly nobody does conventional coring, where you core and actually pull the drill pipe out each time you want to retrieve a core. You've got wireline coring with steering runs. So in other words, you can't steer a, a coring system per se, but you may be able to pull it out and put in a downhole motor to steer a certain bit of the trajectory if it goes out of line, but of course you lose the core. And then there are wireline coring options which are there, but they tend to give very small core and take quite a long time to get. And then you've got a mixture which is of cord and open hole drilling. So a method which I would look at very hard in all honesty is to drill an open hole, run appropriate geophysics, down the hole and I'll go into the geophysics in due course. Set a wedge or cut a branch, cut a branch, cut a lip, you'll drill, you pull back, you ground down, you ground off and you want to go up and take a sample or you want to, um, uh, you want to take a sample with core so you switch to a coring system and go back in and do that because maybe your, your profile of your tunnel is not so totally horrible that you need core all the way and core is very expensive and slow and I'll show you that. So if we're going to look at uh, directional core drilling, so we can look at it with uh, conventional coring with occasional run replacements with the downhole motor. Um, as, you, as I said, this requires appropriate survey systems and there'll be areas that are not cored. You could run wireline coring with occasional string pulls, pull out of hole, poo, I love that, that's the oil field term, uh, or run in holes with a downhole motor. Your survey retrieval by wireline is therefore slow. You're not getting instant information out. You're having to send a tool down which does your survey and get it out because you've got a wireline coring system and you haven't got any means to transfer that information in and out. <clears throat> or you can go to specialist directional coring systems. Surveying in these is slow and the, the core diameter is small. Borehole survey is extremely important. Basically, the backbone of what we're using is accelerometer and magnetometer systems. The beauty of the accelerometer and the magnetometer is you can spin it like hell and it doesn't get confused. When you stop it, it knows where it's going. And basically you've got a mag field which is somewhere over there and you've got a gravitational field there and you do a cross product and you've got east and you do a cross product with down, you've got north or you've got magnetic north. And of course, if you've got um, uh, magnetite or other difficult rocks, you've got a problem steering with it but it works. It has other advantages too. Gyro systems, which are no longer like the um, gyroscope of spinning a bicycle wheel and it keeps an alignment, um, they're no longer there. We've got microelectrical mechanical systems and fiber optic gyros. And neither of these are really suitable for directional drilling where you rotate the drill string. They might suit a downhole motor where you're not, but they get confused if you spin them. Uh, so you can't use them with that. There was an old system, uh, photo bar, reflex photo bar, which was a system where you used to look down the drill string and you'd see circles in alignment, and there was three of them. You could see the relative out of alignment of the drill string, and it was a very good system, except it was slow to use and used film. You had to photograph these things, and it could be so easily done. I, I think they've got a lot of benefits, incremental systems to find out where you're going. Now, one of the beauties, particularly if you're using this up here, is that it's possible to intersect a hole, typically a vertical hole, but you can intersect another hole. Because if you've got a set of magnetometers and accelerometers, and particularly magnetometers, you can go down this hole, 
uh, with a big magnet, which you can lift up and down, or you can go down with an electromagnet where you flip-flop the uh, polarities. And the magnetometers in the survey tool will pick up where it is. So if you think that, say you're using a typical accelerometer magnetometer tool. Yeah, I haven't finished yet. Um, uh, and you're going out, you've got a series of tangents to the curve at each point you measure it. There is an inherent er measurement error within the tool, which might be 0.2 of a degree or something. So you've got all of these things which you're trying to line up on a number of great circles or some other line of integration. You might use cubic splines, you might use a number of things. Um, and there is a potential error that builds up. So you actually want to know exactly where you are. And if somebody drills a hole here, you can come past, and at this point, this can magnetically transfer to this tool and with the changing fields being measured in this tool, it is possible to work out what the relative distance is and pull something back online. So say if you're out 1,500 or 1,800 metres or something, you might have a, a field which is as wide as this room, essentially. You don't know quite where it is, but you can pull it back online. Right. So here's a typical directional drilling control panel. And here you would... Oh, sorry, thank you very much for telling me. Um, typical drilling control panel. And here you would have a, say you're drilling horizontally and you've got a tool that's built in this direction. You want to know what that tool face angle is. So there's a, this is a driller's um, thing. You might want, if you're going more this way, to look at a tool face angle if you were looking at it on a uh, plane downwards. You want to know what the tool azimuth is. And you want to know what the tool inclination is. Well, these things come out of things automatically. Why well, did go there? Right. <clears throat> so, borehole geophysics is incre incredibly useful. Um, civil engineers, by and large, don't like geophysics and they don't trust it because they don't know it. But um, it's, it's a way to go. It doesn't tell you anything, everything. But you build up a picture. And you build up a picture of where you might have uncertainty and where you need more information. So resistivity, you're measuring the resistance of the rock and you're measuring current flow or you've got a constant current and you're measuring a voltage. You find out where the resistance is. Particular rocks have particular resistance. You have a, a density probe, which will pick up what you're dealing with. It essentially measures the number of electrons in the rock. You've got natural gamma. There's an awful lot of rocks down there which um, produce uh, radioactive output, particularly some of the igneous stuff. Uh, you've got induced polarization. You're looking at capacitive effects on a uh, resistivity probe, essentially. You've got magnetically susceptible pr susceptibility probes, which will tell if uh, typically used in ore bodies to locate magnetically susceptible rocks. You've got a neutron log, which is... Hydrogen, oil, and water. So it, <clears throat> it's, it measures hydrogen. So for oil and water, if that's what you've got there, you're looking at porosity. So it's a porosity log of a form. Of course, if you're dealing with something like coal, which I tend to some of the time, it doesn't help you because there's an awful lot of hydrogen in coal. And there's a caliper, it's spelt with two L's, um, where you're looking for hole diameter. Hole diameter can tell you an awful lot about what's going on. Um. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry, doesn't want to go. Yes, it does. Borehole geophysics too. Now, <clears throat> another thing that's incredibly useful from a geotechnical point of view are the televiewers, which get pictures. If you've got a dry hole, which you never have, but you could uh, use an optical televiewer and you look at borehole breakout and other things. Acoustic televiewers work in wet holes uh, because they send out ultrasonic pulses and you measure the amplitude and you're measuring the time lapse of the signal. <coughs> and you've got the sonic tools. Simple sonic tool sends a pulse out and it measures it down here. More complex tool will send out a pulse, which is a compressive pulse and a shear pulse, and you're measuring the time difference between the two of them. And you've got, so they're full waveform tools, which give you idea of um, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Of course, they're not uh, anisotropic. But something that is anisotropic in a particular way is a thing called 
an alpha rotating dipole. And that is you pulse in a direction and you pulse in another direction. You change the relative um, amplitudes and it appears that this thing, mathematically it appears that it's rotating. And you can find out the different speeds in different directions. And it's a very good stress indicator. So here's a whole pile of it's a demonstration log, and you haven't got a hope of looking at it, but I've got a caliper, different rocks, a caliper. I've got density. I've got natural gamma. I've got a sonic velocity. I've got resistivity presented at cost plot. So there's something happening there, which is cold seam. Um, we've got P wave and S wave. Compressive and shear wave, and they're written as slowness. And you've got your dynamic Young's modulus, your dynamic Poisson's ratio. And if you're brave and possibly stupid, you might get a uniaxial compressive strength from it. Probably add up the stupid, actually. Here is an acoustic televiewer picture of a borehole, two boreholes. One is a, in a siltstone, and you there you've got a very clear breakout. And what we're looking at there, if this thing wouldn't go, is this hole, which is like this, being crushed. And so you've got compressive failure on two sides. And this is a picture of unwrapping this thing and looking at it. And what it is is a direct measure. And if you're drilling in the, your tunnel alignment, it's a direct measure of whether you're going to get compressive failure on your tunnel walls because you created a mini tunnel. Um, here's one not quite as favorable, but still very clearly breakout. And that's in a meta siltstone. So that's been metamorphosed a bit. Um, <clears throat> So if we want to get sons down directional holes, the oil field build a whole suite of things which sits in behind the tool and communicates backwards through the tool. While you're doing it, it tends to be pretty slow. Civil or mining, we tend to log after the hole is drilled and we run the string down and we drag the sons backwards. And we need to keep the hole full of water or mud for the following sons, um, sonic resistivity, induced polarization, acoustic teleview. You've got to keep it full of fluid. If you can't keep it full of fluid, it doesn't work. So then you've got to build some system to make sure that, that hole which you're drilling is always full of fluid. So you can't start drilling at a hillside when it drains out because it won't work. Um, so you've got to maintain pressure at the whole collar. This requires a fully cemented wellhead. I'll call it a wellhead, call it a standpipe. You've got to have a rotary seal if you're rotating. Pressure relief valve, which in the oil field terminology is called a choke, which will let bits come through. And you need some pressure to keep the hole full. Pressure may also be needed to support the whole wall because drilling fluid pressure, particularly if you use a mud which puts a, um, a filter cake on the wall of the hole, will actually put pressure out to hold it out. Putting pressure out to put it out has other problems, though. You may um, uh, hydrofract the hole. I'll come into that. So drilling sensing for rock type, it's also possible to drill with a uh, torque and thrust measurement. And this is typically done at a drill rig to determine things that's going on. But um, you can all, we've also built an at-the-bit sensor where you're measuring torque and thrust right behind the drill bit. And you need some signal processing down hole because there's an awful lot of information that gets there as a bit judders through the rock. Um, picking peaks and picking averages and doing things, but it's quite possible to pick the different kinds of rock material that you're drilling through. Very importantly, you've got to communicate with whatever's down the hole. So you might pump down a, a memory tool. This is a, either a memory survey tool or a memory geophysical probe. Um, it's all right if it's geophysics. It probably doesn't matter if it's got enough room to store what's needed. You just pull it back and it records on board. You can't do that with all things because you've got to have some interaction between the operator and the um, and the tool down the hole. So it only works with some tools. The typical way of oil field uh, communication is by a mud pulse. So you have a, a, a pulser which sits down behind the downhole motor with the rotary steering system. And it's a valve which opens and closes, not totally, but changes the pressure in the drill mud and that communication is sent back up the drill string and you listen to the pressures changing but it's got a 10 board or so rate so it's a pretty slow communication so you don't want to send too much information up. There are electromagnetic systems which basically transmit sideways up the rock but you've got to have the right kind of rock otherwise it doesn't work. You've got typically the civil engineering stuff of the shallow electromagnetic systems where people will be drilling something for services and they'll walk over it and they'll get a transmission up and they're, they're quite good if you're not too deep. 
And then you've got wire drill pipe. And wire drill pipe is really the way to go because you can get high-speed communications up it. And, you know, we've got 20... I think we can get 20 kiloboard through a system, which is starting to communicate. So there's a wired drill pipe. There's the wired communication inside, and they just make up when we do it. Now, borehole fluid mechanics because is very important because it may be the break. So your fluid flow is to move cuttings out of the hole, cool the bit, and power drilling systems, particularly down the hole motors. You could have laminar or turbulent flow resumes. Um, you ought to remember your basic fluid mechanics. Um, laminar being it flows in lines and uh, turbulent meaning it's tumbling over um, and there's very different pressure drops with them. Um, <clears throat> if you're not rotating, you lead to the formation of cuttings beds and possible trapping of the drill string in the hole. Now, I've worked in a place where the trapping of the drill string is a fairly frequent occurrence with uh, downhole motors. What's actually full happening is bits of... Um, the rock are falling out and they're forming a, a plug around the drill string. There isn't much room to move because there's a cutting bed formed on the bottom. And then medium and finer particles build up behind it and the hydraulic pressure of driving it back compacts us and locks the drill string in place. And it's a, a good way to lose equipment, to lose a hole and cause yourself a lot of problems. Um, you may power a downhole motor or use a jetting bit. Um, and you've got to watch out for drilling fluid pressures that may lead to hydrofracture. This thing isn't going to play ball with me, is it? Right. So if we look at a situation, say we've got an imaginary hole, which is that trajectory there. We've got a horizontal line there, so we've got a static head of fluid pressure. If we want to put some static pressure on that, through having a choke at the outlet, a wellhead and a choke. So our pressure's up to here. And then you start pumping through the drill bit and you've got fluid pressure loss back down the hole, which is friction. So your friction is building back up from this outlet pressure here. The question is, when you get in here, is your pressure ro risen high enough that it's going to fracture the rock and let it out? And a lot of the, sh the shallow applications this is the critical limit on what you can do because you will blow the ground to pieces if you want to run your systems. You can do things, but you've got to pay attention to your drilling fluid and mud engineering. So if we think about laminar flow, with a, that's usually a higher viscosity. It never quite sleeps, sweeps the, clean, the hole clean. It's got, actually got zero boundary velocity. You've got a higher pressure loss for a given velocity. Cuttings are held in suspension in steep sections, so if you're going down steeply and straightening out, that's a real benefit. But it settles out in the flat ones because it's got very little room to go. And the benefit of some of the higher viscosity muds, and there's a whole world of mud engineering here, is that they form filter cakes on the whole wall, which prevent fluid loss. So you're not going to lose your, for your fluid into the formation. Having said nasty things about viscous things, sometimes putting a viscous pill or a sweep through the hole is a very good way of pulling out cuttings that just don't want to come otherwise. You just change the, the hydraulics. If you've got turbulent flow, it sweeps the hole cleaner, but it, you need a higher flow rate. If you drop your viscosity, your pressure drops lower, and you've got this balancing act between mud types. Do you go with something which is more viscous and you stay on the laminar? Do you say with things not? So... There's a lot of tendency to go through sheer th thinning fluids. And if you think particularly about a hole which might have a trajectory like that, which has good application, what you want to shift things along the horizontal and shift it up the vertical is quite different between the two. You don't mind if it drops out on the bottom of this hole because it's going to drop out when you add a drill pipe. But if you add a drill pipe here, you don't want it all going down the bottom and forming a plug at the bottom. So you want something that will set up like a jelly in here, and the moment you start pumping, it starts moving out again. So there's a bit of mud engineering involved. <clears throat> so the problems with cutting build-up is this, and this is shown with much more room. You've got a drill pipe sitting on the bottom of the hole, and you've got this building up and building up, and these may never move. All your flow is here, and this builds up and you can get all sorts of problems with that. Um, right. <clears throat> so pressure in the hole is a key issue. So you don't fracture the ground and lose your fluid and <clears throat> have your drilling fluid pass up on surface and people ask you questions and um, it's a bit embarrassing. 
So you need to keep an quid annulus between the drill pipe and the hull. You need to keep your, your velocity high enough. You need to reduce your viscosity, but at the same time, you need to form a filter cake to avoid drilling fluid loss in many formations. Having got these muds with these complex features, you've got to have uh, drill fluid treatment prior to discharge. Any drill fluid, you've got to do it. The more viscous the fluid is, it's harder to get the particles out of it. So mud pits in the normal form won't work because it won't settle out quick enough. So then you need to go to things which are shakers, which take the particles out, possibly run them through cyclonic separators, and then maybe a centrifuge. And then you've got to dispose of the, um, the cuttings. Um, drill string mechanics. Um, you've got to think that if you're sliding, so well, friction opposes the direction of movement. So if you're going to slide something down the hole, it's going to be opposed, uh, typically with a mud motor, directly opposed by friction. The limit occurs when you're pushing this thing in the hole and the friction built up and this thing starts to want to snake up in the hole because you're pushing hard on it, it's starting to buckle and you call this the onset of sinusoidal buckling. And then you get into stick slip behavior where you're pushing and it slips and it pushing and when it slips, the bit jams into the end of the hole and stalls. And there's things called thrusters which can go on the end, which control the um, amount of pressure on the end of the hole. But when you take it beyond this, to and push really hard, you build a helix and you'll get a lock up in hole. And of course, if you have multiple tiny bends, your friction goes up rap rapidly. Um, you've, you're bending the drill pipe around a, a series of little deviations. And sometimes you can fall into the trap of pushing into a hole, but you can't pull out because your drill string is bent neatly around the natural bends. And when you pull it hard, it's like a rope around multiple bollards. It doesn't want to come out. Uh, you should never get in that position. You should always be able to get out of trouble. If you rotate, then friction is primarily opposed to the rotary motion. The stick slip behavior doesn't occur. You've got, uh, <clears throat> you, you require dynamic control or rotary steering. Um, you've got to have a lot of power to rotate the drill string because you're not just rotating the downhole motor, but you might be rotating two or three kilometers of drill pipe and that weighs a lot. You've got fatigue problems if you obviously want to change bend angle, but most tunnels you don't want to do that with at a sharp angle and you'll find there'll be a drill string will go around it. Um, you want to limit your angular build rate so you're not doing things in too much of a hurry. And you need directional drilling models or drilling models, typically a torque and drag model, which works out the torque and the drag on the drill string to work out where you're going, as well as mud models. So I've done a comparison here, and it's a relative, I can't possibly in the time of this presentation give you um, every scenario. And of course, if you go drilling anywhere in the ground, the same as you go tunneling, uh, horror scenarios exist. You hit things that you don't expect, you lose your fluid, you've got uh, bits fall in maybe, but that's why you're drilling, because you want to find out about these things before you go tunneling and get caught really Badly. So let's look at conventional coring with core barrel on the end of the drill string, which you pull in and out. I've looked at an HQU, which is a pump-in uh, wireline coring system with a 61 millimeter core. I've looked at it with a 96 millimeter hole, which is the standard. I've looked at that with a bigger annulus to give us more room for fluid flow, which is important. I've looked at rotary steering with full oil field costs, and I think there's cheaper options there. Um, with one bit change at a kilometre. So with the HQ ones, we're pulling in and out every 100 metres and doing a correction. That costs you time. I've added in geophysical logging in each case, and I've allowed for a 20-hour operation for 24-hour period, which gives you something realistic, because there's always delays, there's always servicing that requires of, uh, equipment. So let's look at the timing that's required. So conventional coring, we're going to get to 500 metres. You might be out to 45 days, and it's really going ridiculously. If you go to conventional HQ, you might be able to push that out to, you know, something like the 12, 1500 metres in two or three months. To go push it up to 2000 metres just is not practical. And the same would apply. Uh, it's much better if you have some improved annulus. Part of the reason is you've got to pump that um, inner tube into the core barrel and you've got to pull it back. 
And there's a physical limit to, to the speed which you can pump it in because you've got to displace all that fluid around and back down the hole, which is why the bigger annulus works. And there's a limit to how fast you can pull it back. You can swab the hole and drop the pressure at the end of the hole and cause the hole to come in and cause yourself all sorts of nightmares if you pull too fast. Right. Here I then compare that. So this is allowing us to do some... Um, we've got logging there too, and here I've got a situation where we're... No, we're not logging because we've got core. So there's no logging of the hole with the HQ situation. Then I've just drilled a rotary steered hole. So we get out to two kilometres in this situation, this type of rock in... Oh, under 20 days and possibly far or sorry, um, under 10 days and maybe far less than that. You know, there's oil field applications where they've drilled a kilometre a day. Quite their favourable conditions in limestones, which don't fall a bit and don't have vast cavities. So we're looking at best cases. But if you want to log it, it takes you a bit longer and you would want to log it. So you've got time spent logging it. We've allowed for a bit change there. Some good stuff there. Now, if you want to look at the costs, the costs are starting to very heavily fall in favour of rotary steering, which is expensive, 40000 a day or something, um, at about the kilometre range. Um, you, as I said, you can go downhole motor, you can go uh, um, some lower cost rotary steering things here, but it's starting to pay its way extremely well. Um, I didn't put the red dot there, somebody else did. Um, it's worth looking at these things because you can create an open hole, you can log it, you can find out pretty well everything that you need to know with an open hole. And if you run into areas where you don't know what to do, you can probably go back down depending on the size of the system that you're using and whether it's compatible with, say, an HQ coring system uh, or the like. Go back down, cut a lip, cut a core, and get whatever you need if you've actually got to look at it. But you can basically, if you've got miles and miles and miles of sedimentary rock or volcanic rock, volcanic rock's a bit hard for this PCD, depends on the situation. You might end up with a trichome bit or something and it goes slower. Um, you know, it's really a horses for courses and you've got to design these things. But you could potentially have a fully logged uh, hole done over two kilometres for maybe... I've said here 700,000, maybe 800,000, if everything was set up right. There'll be people will disagree with that, but it depends very much on the conditions. Depends on what drill rigs are available to drive this stuff, because these are not common rigs. <clears throat> so we're, what are the limits? We're primarily limited by drilling hydraulics. Is it possible to clear the cuttings without hydrofracturing the ground? Deeper holes are easier from a hydraulic point of view, as the stress in them keeps the hole together and prevents it. Deep holes work because gravity pulls the hole down. We, probably with the tunnel, you don't want to keep on going down to the centre of the earth. Um, and, of course, what are you drilling? And you don't want to have anything to do with soil. And we're still, you never want to drill mixed ground, which is soil and rock, because uh, the systems, it's a bit like tunnelling, having to deal with mixed ground. It makes life very, very difficult. And uh, you don't want to go there. You'll end up having to case it off and change sizes, and you end up with an oil rig there, and it becomes totally impractical. So here I've drawn a picture, which might be a mountain tunnel crossing, which is quite realistic. And here I've got, say, I just drew it by hand the other night. Um, something, say, eight kilometres tunnel, which is not unreasonable. And we want to, we might be able to get it with a drill from that end and a drill from that end. And we can steer into a target that we might be too far off the target to ever bring them into the same point, because by the time you're out uh, four kilometres, your range of uncertainty is too great and you won't be able to pick up the transmission from one tool to another tool. However, if you were to drill this one in from here and drill another one in from here, only because I'm concerned of the shallow depths here, you can't drill very far before your pressures cause you to frack the ground and pull it to a halt, but you can drill from here and you take this on here. You can steer it into a target, which is a vertical hole, and you can keep on going through that target and then you can drill and you can drill onto this one and drill onto the next target. You can set up to do both ends of this and you can do it and you could potentially have an eight and a half kilometre tunnel crossing under a two kilometre mountain done quite efficiently. Now, what do you need to do to find that? Your measurements. Rock type is geophysics or core, rock stress, overcoring or hydrofracture. Uh, you want to find out your fluids types 
um, pressure, tight pressure permeability. Don't always say it's water because it's not. Particularly consider your gases. Um, I found the failure to take account of gases in sedimentary rocks can be pretty appalling. So we measure stress by overcoring. We can do it by hydrofracture. Um, actually doing hydrofracture in a tunnel which might be for a power station is a direct test of how it's going to behave when it's filled with high pressure water. You might hydroject joints by putting packers across them and finding the pressure to open them out. And you might want to look at borehole breakout. Um, it's not a precise measurement, but it, it's useful because it tells you what's actually going to happen in the alignment of the tunnel. Don't do that to me. So here's a picture of one of our overcore tools in a um, bit of core. These are the pins that measure diameter. We've set that in a vertical hole in this case and overcored it. And what we see is an overcore deformation plot of each of the pins. And if we measure the modulus of the rock, and there's more to that than you may think, um, there's a fit of pins, which are the blue axes, and what the actual theor that theoretical best fit uh, deformation curve is. And you can work out stresses from that. <clears throat> rock stress is a whole number of out of hole measurements. Um, post elastic core recovery, Kaiser effect, deformation rate analysis, they're all less precise. The one that we're running at the moment is core ovality. Here's core ovality. We pull core, we sit it on a tool, we rotate the core, we can measure the diameter to a micron. And if you're using the right kind of core bit, you can actually measure the different diameters of the core. Now, it doesn't give you absolute stress, and it won't work. Well, it will work if the, core's, if the, the hole's breaking, because the core isn't necessarily breaking. But you can work out the stress difference one way to the other, and that's just a homogeneous rock equation for working it out. And it's quite useful for finding out when things change. And if you've... The question is, what is the orientation of the core, which comes to be another thing. Permeability and fluid pressure. Ideally, you use uh, straddle packer systems following geophysical hole logging. Um, if you inflate and seal it, you can, without any flow, you can get your fluid pressure, which is important. If you allow inflow and outflow periods and then you shut in so there is no flow, you can watch your pressure build up or your pressure decay and you can calculate permeability. You can't measure storage behavior, in other words, the amount of fluid in the, the fractures in the pores from a single hole, but at any rate. And anybody who uses conventional packer testing needs to be hung, drawn, and quartered because it gives you so little information. It is nonsense. It doesn't give you fluid pressure. It doesn't give you permeability. It measures something associated with wellbore loss, which is the local wellbore loss around a hole. Um, I can't overemphasize that. I see so many engineers go down that path and they really don't understand. Um, so here might be a drill stem test. Um, this is actually done in a vertical hole. I'm not far off finishing. Um, go back. And here we've got a, a test where we set packers. We've opened a valve. It's unpressurized. It's flowed. It's actually got a slope on there. This one hasn't. We've built it up. We've flowed it again, we've built it up, and we can actually get the permeability out of this. It's a good measurement because you're not measuring while you're flowing, and therefore you don't have wellbore loss components of fluid flowing in and out. You're actually measuring what's going on in a no-flow test. Gas in rock, as I've said before, is important. It leads to outbursts, expulsions of gas and rock, ignitions, asphyxiation. And you need to know how much there is of it and whether it can be controlled by ventilation or whether it needs to be drained. And if you're going to do drainage, you require an understanding of the nature of gas storage in pore space, fractures, or by absorption. You need to have some measurements. So you should drill with gas diversion if there's any chance of it. You need gas fluid separation and gas measurement. And if you're using wireline coring, you need extreme care to avoid the need for the, or avoid the inner barrel ejection. You need to be able to shut in the borehole, to, for well control, if things happen, you need to be able to consider. You need to be able to consider manage pressure drilling. So you manage the outlet pressure, and you need to really be able to measure the permeability. Because if you've got gas there, you're going to have to deal with it. Um, didn't move. 
Just a thought here. I was when I was at the World Tunneling Congress in Bergen. It showed a picture of a guy sitting, standing in a cherry picker um, in a tunnel in Norway, and he was. There was something like 1,200 meters underground because Norway does this, and they've got mountains, and they go through them. And there was water pouring out of a borehole in the face. And he was standing there with a packer, which he eventually got in, and they sealed it, and it went up to 8 megapascals. Now, that's like... Um, and then they cemented it by bits and pieces of doing this. It's dangerous. Um, it's a bit like fighting uh, Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay, as he used to be, directly up with your fists. You're going to lose, or if you don't lose, you're blooming lucky. So one of the things really to do here is to look at drilling exploration holes which are ahead, and instead of doing little bits of grouting, you use high-pressure uh, frack pumps to drive cement grout, and they will go in and they will displace anything and seal it. So, you know, you're looking at splitting the ground, and filling every void. It's something to consider. So conclusions. Directional drilling, despite the horrors that I mentioned and the pitfalls, can be a very cost-effective way to conduct site investigations for tunnels. The prime limitations are hole stability, drilling hydraulics, and for holes over one, maybe one and a half kilometres, the switch should be made for, to open hole drilling with geophysics as opposed to coring. Trust in geophysics, it works. Core a specific section later if it's required. And with that, I'll say thank you for listening for a small part of what my company does. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. That was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, we're running quite late, so uh, we have what, what I might do is just take one question from the online audience, and then obviously, if anyone in the room has any questions, then they can, they can ask Ian afterwards. So. Um, so the first question was, um, it, it's regarding the avoidance of polluted land. Um, that they're talking particularly about PFAS. I think they might be referring to a project in, in Melbourne. And I'm just wondering if, if there are any particular considerations around avoiding polluted land when you're using these kinds of techniques. Um. Well, if you drill through polluted land, you're probably going to get some. Yeah. You're probably going to get some of the pollutant out. So it's a matter of how you handle your drill, um, drilling fluid principally, and what you do with the material you separate out from your drilling fluid in due course. Um, you'd also think about obviously PPE, the people, who, the drillers, <laughs> um, what they're using. Yes, problems. <laughs> And then the last, I'll take one last question. Could you inform about the acceptable tolerance of horizontal, horizontality and verticality during drilling? Um, if it's above the acceptable tolerance, how would you control it? Well, the acceptable... Hmm. I think you need to look at this in terms of um, not being precious. Um, if you've got a tolerance, you want to think what you can actually achieve with the drill and whether you're going to achieve more uh, by drilling than not drilling. And um, are you really worried if the hole's out by two or three metres, if it's within the tunnel or just... Uh, it depends on the variability of the geology. You know, if the geology is relatively uh, constant and you're doing exploration or you've got a fault which you're going to hit sort of straight on, um, does it really matter if it drifts? You know, the, your limitations are by the the limitation of the survey tool, which is going to be at the best about 0.2 of a degree, and how closely you can join those up, and how much you check on it. Um, <clears throat> um, so my advice would be, don't be insane about tolerance, because you'll probably gain far more information by just getting on and drilling the hole and finding out a lot more than you did before. Mm. Okay, got one here. Um, I, I might just just to let the people get online. Might just uh, wrap up now for the people uh, online. So um, thank you, and that was a real tour de force. You've gone across um, the, the full gamut of uh, of equipment, of uh, problems that we might face, and and uh, it's uh, it's been a real education for me, and I'm sure everyone else has got um, a lot out of it. Um, I'd. I'd like to like to invite everyone to thank 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 everyone in the usual before we do that just a quick plug um, again for the young members 
uh, on the 31st of March. And also please check out the Australian uh, Tunneling Conference in May as well. But uh, thank you very much, Ian. If any of our online audience want to stay online, they will ask a few questions from the room and I'll leave the stream going for another 10 minutes. I don't mind answering for a bit. If somebody's got something, you know, those who've got to fly, have got to fly. Sure. Uh, Ian, um, you mentioned uh, hydrofracture a couple of times there in the presentation. Um, I had an experience 25 years ago on a hydro, uh, hydro tunneling project in the Philippines where we did a hydrofracture test to determine what extent of steel lining we needed to produce. Mm -hmm. And my recollection of that process was that it was a very imprecise science, it is. the hydrofracture test. Has there been any advance or uh, improvement in that time period? The answer is the improvement has been huge. The improvement has come through the... Um, uh, development of hydrofracture in the field of tight gas and tight oil extraction. So the analysis of what's going on has improved. However, you're not going to change the fundamentals. Fundamentals are that you're usually straddling a, a section of a hole with some packers. You're hoping it'll crack in this direction. In other words, there's not a joint there which will make it crack in that direction. Your assumptions are that the Stress is, uh, the, the major stress is this way and the minor one's this way, so it's going to go out in this way, but it may well roll like that. And what you're looking at with uh, hydrofracture is you shut it in afterwards and you get a closure. Now, if you've got a nice clean break, it'll close and you'll see the closure pressure really well and you can establish it. Right, now, Hamerson and Fairhurst started this thing off, and they started a fashion years ago, and I don't think it was justified. They did it in um, hard rock, and the idea was that the rock was perfectly elastic, and they could crack it, they could find the closure pressure, and then they could reopen it and the whole, with increased pressure. And the whole basis of that was that the rock was still in compression, that the sides matched up absolutely perfectly, in other words, there was no gap, because if you get a bit of rock fall in and there's a gap, you end up pressurising, a, not a hole, but you end up pro, um, pressurising a slot, which is a fracture slot, and your, your entire basis falls apart. It also falls apart if the um, minimum stress or the maximum stress is not in the alignment of the hole, because things are going to want to twist around. And what you actually see when you analyse the closure curves, the pressure decay, because the whole idea is you, you're fracturing something and you've got a pressure decay and you're watching um, for the closure of that um, fracture. If that fracture has a roll on it, then you see what is apparently multiple fracture closures and you're trying to work out which one is which. It'll give you a minimum stress. Um, Occasionally, if you've got the right rock and you're damn lucky, it'll give you a major stress, but by and large, it won't. You've got to split stress measurement into two situations. One is a situation where the rock is not going to fail uh, with a hole, so you, you would overcore it by choice. You get the best measurements out, you might do core ovality. The other one is where the rock is going to fail and you might have borehole breakout or it might be pre-failed by fractures. And in that case, you're really driven to a hydrofracture option, possibly mixed with borehole breakout to work out what is going on. But there's still assumptions there. And if you've got a jointed rock, then you might be trying to jack the joints prop by putting water in them. But who says once you've opened this one, it doesn't hit another joint here and another joint set here and finding one isolated joint. You know, I had one guy say to me, ah, well, I managed to hydrojack a joint here and hydrojack a joint here and hydrojack a joint here and he did six of them and he said we worked out the total stress tensor. Well in most fractured rock you haven't got a hope because uh, there are groups of fractures and they're multiples and you're trying to work out what's going on you'll get a, an idea of the minimum stress you will not get the major stress and often the major stress is what you're after. So this is where we think the core ovality helps come in because the core doesn't always break up to the same degree. Uh, you have a hole which is breaking on the stresses, but you've relieved the stresses on the core. So the core is giving you some idea of stress difference. If the rock's breaking, you might have breakout, which you can look at. You might be able to do hydrofracture. It's a matter of pulling in every technique you've possibly got to try and work out what's there. It's not simple, 
um, you're much better off with solid rock, but then solid rock is less of a problem. Thank you. <laughs> Down one second. Sorry, Diane. Sorry, Diane. Down here. Sorry. Sorry. So, follow. So following on from there, um, if you've got like a highly laminated, horizontally laminated rock mass, how does that, has, does that have a effect or an impact? Like how does that The usual result? way in which we would, well, it depends whether the rock's failing when you drill it or not. Um, if it doesn't fail, you go through and you overcore it. If it does fail, you look at borehole breakout and you maybe do some hydrofracturing and um, work out what is your best estimate. But what you would typically find is, if you look at these things in general, what matters is the strain to which the rock bass is subject. So if you've got a stiff rock, and particularly we find this because an awful lot of sedimentary rock in Australia that we deal with, you have layers of sedimentary strata, some of which is stiff and some of which is not stiff, and some of it is um, downright uh, soft and non-linear, an awful lot of it's non-linear, and quite a lot of it's quite anisotropic too. You, t you might end up typically with um, uh, ratios of stiffness of two, two or three to one. It's not uncommon. Um, but what you find is that the unless you're in complex conditions with faults and other things, that you find you can set the rock into groups, the different laminations that have apparently had a strain put on them. Now, we call that tectonic strain, and um, that's a big name, and it doesn't necessarily mean it comes from tectonic uh, movements. It might come from folding. It might be influenced by um, erosion, you know, an erosion surface, which is a disconformity, you would have completely different strain characteristics below than above because they're completely different sedimentary events. And um, so when that gets squeezed, um, it has uh, stresses which are different depending on the stiffness of the strata and the Poisson's ratios and whatnot. And we find that generally, in the simpler cases... Uh, this concept of tectonic strain, which is the amount of squeeze, so you've got uh, vertical loading, you've got Poisson's ratio, if you work on an elastic basis, you can say, well, my stress should be this. This is the nu upon one minus nu times the vertical stress, which is the classic formula used. But if you have something which has been squeezed or unsqueezed, it will change the stress pretty significantly. And then you find, um, and you can put them into groups and say, well, my tectonic strain, which is the amount of squeeze or unsqueeze in terms of strain that's required, um, that's what's required, or that's what's happened to it, and we can use this as our basis for design in between. Because at the end of the day, you can't measure stress everywhere. You've got to measure it, and you've got to work out a, a stress model, and the model is never nu upon one minus nu times the vertical stress. Um, it is always something else. And, of course, if you have a fault there, particularly a normal fault, you'll find it's totally de-stressed across it. If you've got reverse faults, you can find some interesting surprises because near the fault tips, or for that matter, strike, um, strike slip faults, you find near the fault tip edge, you know, you've, your, stress is, you, your stress has been relieved by the movement of the fault, but at the end of the fault, unless that fault has progressed right through the surface or something, that movement is taken up by high tip stresses, which are, are there. And you can find things that are very significantly different, and they might lead to rock bursting or all sorts of nasty things. Depends on the rock type. So yeah. there's your answer as best I can give it. No, that's good. Thanks. One more question. Just a quick one. I am interested in knowing how, what, what tools do you have for dealing when you are drilling like one kilometer far away and you go through a faulty zone to do not lose the, the whole rig in there or an expansive soil? Well, there's a whole lot of ways of dealing with it. If you're in soil, you really don't want to get into soil, but you would... Um... Part of this is your drilling fluids, 
Uh, so you're stopping things expanding. Part of it would be, do you want to go to a situation where you're going to run a, um, uh, a liner casing? In other words, remount to a bigger hole, run a casing through it. Another way that you might consider is to really hit it with very, very high pressure cement and try and displace whatever is in there, but you might not be able to do that either. Um, let's be honest, I drew that last picture, the one underneath the mountain with a possible number of holes, because there are a lot of drill holes, directional holes, which have been terminated because you simply cannot get through fault material. It continues to erode. You cannot stabilise it. You can't do anything. Um, but you get cleverer as you get older and you get experienced and you learn how to do things. Um, you might jet it out. So you've got some an area which is soft soil. So there's a real option there to jet at the material. And then there's an option to squeeze cement into that with a stabilizing cement. You know, you're talking bucks. Um, because by the time you do these down uh, two or three kilometers, this the tripping in and out to do this, these things cost money. But you know, it might be worth it um, if it saves you the hole and you've got another couple of hundred metres to go to finish, it might be worth going to these things. There are methods, and a lot of them have come out of the oil field. Um, the, the question, what we've dealt with is, how do you take these oil field techniques where we've taken them across into mining and they've come across into mining, and then how do you take them across into civil? Um, probably the hardest there is getting the appreciation of the power of geophysics. Um, Civil engineers like to look at, and geotechnical engineers like to look at bits of core. Um, and a lot of, so do I. Um, you know, I've got a degree in geology as well as two in engineering. So, um, but um, sometimes you're much better off financially to go the geophysical route. You've got many more options available to you. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we'll uh, wind it up there. So. Um, have we still got drinks at the back? I think we can mingle here, and then and then for anyone who wants to go, we'll we'll go on to the uh, we'll go on to the pub. So um, just invite everyone to to thank Ian once again, and we'll wrap up.